Welcome everyone to the first edition of our new Movie Night podcast. Our special guest is Dr. Viola Shafiq, who is an Egyptian-German film theorist, curator, scholar, and filmmaker. She is known for writing and directing My Name is Not Ali, which came out in 2011, and directing the document, uh, documentary Arij, Scent of a Revolution, in 2014. She's the author of Arab Cinema, History and Cultural Identity, which was first published in 1998 and most recently revised in 2016. The book has become an indispensable touchstone for students studying the rich heritage of Arab movies and Arab cinema. She's also the author of popular Egyptian cinema, Gender, Class and Nation, and the editor of the brand new uh, book, Documentary Filmmaking in the Middle East and North Africa. She's taught at Lud Ludwig Maximilian University, the American University in Cairo, and Zurich University, among others, and has worked as a consultant for many film festivals around the world. Viola, welcome to this podcast. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Thank you so I much would... for <laughs> yeah, making this possible. Thank you. Of course, it's, a, it's an honor. I was telling you that I bought your book many, many years ago, and uh, for me, it helped me make sense of what Arab cinema is and might be. I'm curious if you can give us a little sense of when you decided that you were interested in cinema from the Arab world, um, as opposed to, or in addition to cinema as a medium, film as a medium more broadly. Well, just before you started um, letting people in, we were speaking about displacement, right? So yeah. I guess we have a shared history of, well, displacement, or at least, you know, sort of a growing up between countries. Uh, so this is what actually the reason why uh, I got interested in Arab cinema, uh, because I was, uh, well, I lived, I was born in Germany and I lived uh, parts of my childhood in Egypt, but still when I started studying, I was uh, in Germany. And I worked uh, during my studies, I was very lucky to work at the Metropolis, which is a communal cinema in Hamburg, um, which is also today a sort of small, very small, um, uh, media, um, as a, um, sorry, <laughs> a sort of uh, cinematic. So they are collecting films as well. Uh, and they allowed us to curate. It was very, uh, the, the director was very open. So uh, I started curating um, uh, film series. And uh, I started, of course, with, you know, Egypt and Palestine and Syria. These were the countries I was interested in. And I tried to present. And so uh, the trigger for my PhD thesis was actually a question that was posed to me by one of the, uh, by, by um, an, a journalist uh, during the opening. She said, what's so special about uh, Arab cinema and how does it is, it, is it different than any other cinema in the world? And I, I guess that was, was my, my um, yeah, the reason and my motivation why I started looking for a culture for the issue of cultural identity. What's so special about uh, Arab cinema? And I went into into the history of it, and of course, it was also a search for, uh, let's say, myself, but also um, a way to use cinema as a platform to uh, present that region. Yeah. Uh, which I felt was at the time in the, uh, and this I'm speaking about the mid late eighties, uh, was very underrepresented. Plus Palestine particularly was very, uh, you know, negatively presented in the European press and in Germany. Uh, so this was all kind of a heavy, uh, you know, burden. Uh, to people who have a, a link to the Arab world at the time. So for, for me, it was something that I needed to work on. And I think it was very important to go to go kind of uh, public with and through cinema. Yeah. I wonder at that moment, the journalist asks you that question. What's so special? Is it a question that you felt you knew the answer to and you were angry that she didn't or he didn't know the answer to it? Or is it that you also didn't know the answer? What is so special about the cinema? Yeah, I think, um, uh, well, I, I think because I wasn't, I was still a student and I, yeah. 
I, I was just doing, I think I'm, I was still with my master's. Right? So I didn't really know how to answer exactly. Yeah. Particularly, there was always at the time also this, um, this uh, slogan of, or this, this uh, accusation of uh, plagiarism looming in somewhere, you know, as if, because the West has, had invented this uh, technique and the whole techno technology, uh, there was a suspect, uh, well, it was suspected that Arab cinema uh, uh, is just, you know, an imitation and the, that there is nothing special about it, except of course the language and, you know, the folkloristic part of it and so on. And uh, for me then to, to dive into the history of Arab cinema and also particularly actually popular uh, cinema was an important aspect because or an important uh, device for me to unravel uh, actually this, the, the pecu peculiarities. And for me, my, I think the main, the core, uh, let's say, message of Arab cinema uh, of the book was, particularly the, the first part is that I found that there was this attempt to uh, bring in, uh, you know, cultural traditions from the region and to recycle them, to adapt them to uh, cinema, to the new medium, uh, particularly music, but also, uh, uh, you know, as I said, uh, as I also found um, uh, some visual concepts, but also the shadow plays, uh, you know, more, more of the folklore, also the uh, folk um, uh, traditions. The local theater, of course, also. Yeah. yeah. And then, I mean, this is one part. And then we have the other aspect that I'm working on, actually, on my, or I have been working on a, a fourth book that is hopefully also soon to appear, uh, which is then the more uh, uh, revolutionary part, or let's say yeah. the part that is related to cultural resistance in, in the more political sense, like, uh, you know, the revolutionary cinemas that developed, particularly also in North Africa, in the framework, and of course in Palestine, uh, yeah. in, in, in the framework of uh, um, anti-colonialism. Let's, let's go back to that moment. So um, this is the late 80s or early 90s uh, when you are turning your thesis into, into a book or when you're finishing your thesis. This is before the internet. This is not, there isn't a huge archive. You can just go online. You can't order DVDs. You can't download things on Vimeo or how do you even get all these all these uh, titles that you're describing from the 20s and the 30s and the 40s. Um, I have a photo for those who can't see the screen of some, what I thought was a National Archive. I don't think it is. I think you told me that it's not now. But tell me about the process of going to Egypt to actually see all these films that you, I'm sure, didn't grow up watching. Well, as I said, the photo, I think it should be the, it must be the Behna uh, company, which was in Alexandria, which was reopened as a cultural center. Uh, and they were, you know, it was a production company. It used to be in the, in the golden era and uh, Egyptian era. And um, uh, it was then also, I think they were also distributing films, but I'm not, I'm not 100% sure, you know, but sure. uh, it could be. Um, anyway, so uh, the, 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 uh, I never entered actually an Egyptian archive, to be honest. Okay. Uh, I just watched some films in the then archive, but I never had a chance to enter any of these, uh, uh, of the facilities where the films are, which I, I hear are in horrible conditions. Uh, but at least at the time, it was still possible to watch films. What I used actually more extensively in, in Egypt were, was the Catholic, uh, the Catholic, sen uh, the Catholic, um, there was a Catholic film, uh, um, not an ar a film archive, but an archive for, for um, uh, 
uh, articles and so on. And and then also Marcus um, Sorgen Maria, which was I, I can I don't know how to translate that. It it's a small center that was actually yeah. um, uh, founded. It's, it's also hosting the film critics in 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 Cairo. It was founded in the mid. 70s and they have also an archive had an archives with you know newspaper clippings and some books and so on so these were the ones that i went to in in cairo uh, then um, very useful for me was the um, uh, and very important was actually the cinematic in algeria you know this was at the time the biggest collection for not only african films but uh uh, third world films, but also for Arab films. So there, I I actually watched a good part of films, and and also could go uh, to to um, yeah, and 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 went into their archive to <clears throat> uh, yeah uh, what uh, read and so yeah. On. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm going to ask you to do an impossible thing, Viola. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to ask you to summarize 140 years of cinema history in uh, a few minutes, okay? So just try to humor me. In, in your book, I, uh, uh, when I read it at first, um, you say in 18, 1896, only a few months after the first screening year in Europe had taken place, films by the Lumiere brothers were shown to an exclusive Egyptian audience. So this is the first time the medium makes it to the Arab world in 1896. Um, Give us a sense of what films were like be between 1896 and the 1930s. And then let's kind of go phase by phase um, from all the way until maybe the end of the 20th century. Um, so let's talk about from 1896 to the early, the, the 20s and 30s, what that moment was like, and then we can keep on going. Uh, um... Okay, now now this is almost too much, but okay, <laughs> okay. The first films, I mean, you know, the Brothers Lumiere. These were yeah. uh, something like at, at first these were a minute films that were just a minute long, and yeah. and they we can consider them the first documents uh, of uh, you know uh, of. Film history, yeah. uh, because they were, you know, like the the the, the train station and the, the the and the workers of the company and so on. But the Lumiere brothers and also other uh, European companies sent pretty soon uh, their cameramen to um, many uh, regions, but particularly, of course, to North Africa, Egypt. You have to know that Egypt was already in, uh, with regards to European photography, the first and most photographed uh, country um, uh, ever. Yeah? yeah, since the since the invention of of photography, um, and of course also Palestine and uh, and the Holy Land. Exactly, the Holy Land. Yeah. Um, so uh, uh, they also sent their cameramen naturally, and and these films were more or less, you know, uh, they were were meant for the European market, and uh, but interestingly, these films are. I don't. We don't know what sort of films then were shown in 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 uh, North Africa and uh, in Egypt. But first, this was an exclusive audience in the sense that, uh, well, in, in in Morocco, it was you know. Uh, yeah. The, the king and or the sultan and elsewhere also uh, in Egypt these must have been most probably uh, European and, and and you know rich Egyptians who were at first able to see it. but pretty soon you know by 1906 we have already the first smaller uh, cinematographs and, and smaller uh, cinemas showing uh, you know, whatever was also available elsewhere, and in yeah. nineteen, in, in around in during the World War, First World War, we have you know already uh, regular movie uh, theaters in Cairo, uh, which had a very normal or regular uh, screening program like elsewhere, and it was actually also tailored to the local audience in the sense that they had loads for the ladies, they had someone harem um, screenings, but otherwise, you know, they had, uh, you know, um, uh, 
uh, I mean, uh, uh, news reels showing, yeah. but also, uh, uh, but also Chaplin films and so sure. on. So then films. I'm going to zoom forward a little bit past the First World War. Um, tell us a little bit about the importance and significance of the establishment of Studio Masr in the mid '30s, and what sort of uh, phase that that uh, kicked off. And yeah. Egypt. Yeah. Already, Studio Mesra is, let's say, now let's just make it clear. Egypt was one of the first uh, uh, local um, uh, film pro producing countries for the reason that it was, uh, you know, uh, um, yeah, it, it, it had just, it, it could, it, it was uh, economically uh, rich enough to be able to produce or, or to, to produce films. And this was actually prepared also already during the, the 1920s. Yeah, there, there was uh, not only where there are the so-called mutamastirin, which means uh, foreigners who lived in Egypt, you know, and, and uh, were based there, who could also, who, who kind of uh, transported uh, the technology, but also had the money. But there were also Egyptians, uh, uh, local uh, entrepreneurs or businessmen or um, uh, people who were or even artists who were able to collect money or had sufficient money in order to invest uh, into the new media and uh, so there were people like uh, Fatma Rojdi or uh, you know or, or, um, um, uh, Bahiga Hafez, an arist a daughter of uh, aristocrats, but there wa was also uh, Togo Mizrahi, for instance, um, offspring of a rich uh, Jewish family, a and they created the first studios, which were not, which was not Studio Musk. Studio Musk comes at at uh, it's already the peak of the movement of creating studios there. The interesting thing about this is that it came from a bank, you know, uh, yeah. the studio, uh, the Misra. Bank, so it was sort of as a sort of mm. national investment. So this was a new phase, and actually the first phase was more that you know like um, the adventurer phase, where uh, individuals, rich yeah. individuals, or or uh, also artists who collected the big money they had and invested all what they had, you know, also and and work. This is when it uh, became an industry. This is when it became a commercial exactly. venture. So the, 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 this is um, a turning point in the sense that it, it, now we have uh, an an industrial. Um, um, place with you know with all the technology now mm -hmm. all the technology was there the film lab the uh, uh, sound studio and everything what was necessary in order to really create a, a stable and actually also during the second world war what many people do not know is that the British uh, newsreels uh, for uh, and the Middle East were created also at the Studio Mesr. So yeah. um, I'm curious, uh, can you give me a sense of when did Studio Mesr stop being relevant? What was its uh, sort of heyday? So from the mid thirties, it starts, when, did, when was its complete heyday? Well, you know, this was the first studio to be also nationalized because mm -hmm. uh, it uh, so the nationalization after independence, because, you know, of these kind of socialist programs that were introduced and uh, Nasser sh shifting away from, uh, you know, from um, from the West mm -hmm. and turn to the to to socialism. This is when he started. Uh, there was a gradual um um, nationalization of uh, certain entities. What, the first one was Studio Mesco because they did nationalize the bank. Yeah. Yeah. The others came later. Uh, so uh, and then they uh, created in the nineteen. I don't know exactly when, to be honest. Uh, they created the new, uh, uh, you know, new studios uh, uh, in in the Al Ahram. But all these studios still were working and are working until today. You know. Okay. So. Uh, 
basically it was after nationalization that studio must bit by bit um lost its and also uh, there were uh, there was one or two big fires that also destroyed much yeah, of what it had in its archive and and so on yeah so today it's yeah. just you know like one of the many places so when um staying with egyptian films in the mid uh up until the nationalization did uh, the industry, uh, did the establishment of Studio Masir being a sort of a place for industry and a place for commerce, did that change uh, the artistic nature of the films that are coming out of the studio versus some of the sort of like art house studios? Um, did the style of films coming out of, uh, out of Egypt change during that period? No, what I argue basically is that, you know, um, what actually changed film culture at the time was rather, you know, that this was the time where in the 1960s, particularly where where there was, you know, this was the phase of decolonization and and also of all these new waves uh, uh, in, in Europe and Latin America and elsewhere. So in Egypt, also, there was, you know, there, there was a film club and so on. And, and this is where you know where where uh, film culture started changing but actually the, the state itself uh, was rather more interested in 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 um supporting films that were you know nationalist in tone or you know or back the the authoritarian version of uh, the decolonization but yeah. not necessarily it was not necessarily interested in in creating an avant-garde uh, film culture and so um, actually the, the 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 these nationalizations and and the um, uh, uh, the bureaucrats uh, bureaucratization of, of the film industry, all this led actually to a decrease of production and not necessarily to, uh, uh, to a, a change in, you know, it remained the same uh, either melodramatic or com comic or musical style that was, was uh, uh, used also before or was presented before, but at the same time, um, there were individual uh, filmmakers who were trying against all odds, you know, like Shadab yeah. Salem, uh, Yusuf Shaheen and, and uh, Taufiq Saleh and so on. And some of them even left the country during uh, the Nasserist uh, time because they had no, uh, they did not see a chance to produce their films there and went to Lebanon, for instance. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Can you t tell us a little bit about um, what are some of the sort of themes and trends going on in, in Morocco and Algeria and sort of North Af the rest of North Africa during the 40s and 50s that really separate it um, from what's happening in Egypt because of the, the colonial sort of relationship? Okay, in, uh, except for very, uh, you know, a few individuals like, for example, Shamana Shikli uh, in, in, uh, in Tunisia, generally, um, or in Syria also, there were some, you know, like uh, pioneers, uh, generally, um, uh, Fre particularly French colonialism is said to have hampered a lot, you know, a, a development that was possible in Egypt due to many factors. One of them was the British, uh, uh, British um, <clears throat> uh, hegemony there. Um, in in the other countries, there was, uh, you know, like in we know in North Africa, there were centers of production, uh, which were producing uh, colonial films, uh, partly French speaking or partly also local in local lang languages. There was this attempt in Morocco, for example, kind of to breach into the local market with some Darija speaking films, but this was not very successful. Um, uh, while the Egyptian films were more um, more uh, popular there, because they they were produced by another Arab country, these uh, these colonial films were not so popular. And when uh, the French left, 
actually the, these um, centers of, of production were actually closed down, be it in Tunisia, Algeria, or in, in Morocco. And the, the filmmakers there had to start from scratch. And uh, what happened there is that that also the state uh, did a lot in order to back and, and uh, local production. But this is, means also that state, the production there was either uh, very much linked to um, this kind of, of uh, decolonizing discourses, but also men, uh, you know, uh, interests. Uh, uh, one or, uh, you know, we're just simply then trying to cater or to reproduce the popular type of, of cinema. Yeah. Um, yeah, so uh, uh, basically the, let's say, a real new wave of, of Arab, uh, the new Arab cinema, as it was called at the time, started appearing in the 80s, 70s, 80s. Uh, that means almost uh, 15 or 20 years after um, the um, respective um, national independences in the different uh, Arab countries, uh, for the reason that then only uh, the, there was, you know, a sufficient infrastructure on the one hand, but also a generation of filmmakers who either went abroad or were trained bit by bit locally, tra trained themselves or went abroad to study and came back uh, to produce their, uh, to make films. But the problem is that um, in the course of the 90s, this uh, kind of state uh, sponsored um, uh, productions, um we're actually also you know kind of faced with 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 more and more authoritarian policies uh which meant that uh filmmakers from all uh, arab countries except for egypt turned towards the west particularly europe to co-produce their films uh and this was the only way um actually to to uh continue making films in these countries which is actually a quite deplorable and sad yeah. development or was at the time but at the same time it produced you know an artistically and uh, also very uh, and in terms of 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 uh, topics very rich uh cinema Let's, I want to ask you, so I mentioned in the bio that um, the book Arab Cinema History and Cultural Identity has just been revised. Um, what did you add and why did you choose to revise it? Well, it has re been revised twice. Yeah. In 2007 and then 2016. And it was actually every time, well, uh, in the, the the original book was rather uh, you know focused on on the issue of cultural identity, but then of course I moved on to more or less uh, yeah give a give an, a survey on the new developments. So the particularly the the last edition of uh, 2016 edition was uh, focused more on new uh, you know topics also that are discussed in 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 uh, uh, international film theory such as trans transnationalism so this was a new kind of topic that i that i uh, introduced uh, to the third uh, edition and also particularly in uh, and I, I tried also of course to pay tribute to the new developments for example in the gulf region where there was no production before uh, uh, the turn of the new millennium or very little let's say very very little yeah so let's let's talk a little bit about you as a filmmaker um i was unfamiliar with your films before recently and uh you know usually film theorists are not also film filmmakers um and from your perspective this might sound like a silly question but um who were some of your inspirations as a filmmaker this the film i have showing right now the lemon tree um came out in 1993 who were some of your uh folks who you look to as inspirations, who you try to channel in your work? 
Um, well, actually, you know, the, the issue is that I, I actually started studying uh, fine arts and my <laughs> first inspirations were uh, actually experimental films. Yeah. Um, yeah, so uh, the turn then to make, um, so this kind of experientiality you, you find still in the lemon tree. Yeah, uh, but which is beautifully shot, just beautifully shot. Yeah, uh, and it, it was a combination of a short story and the, the biography of, of the uh, uh, yeah, a writer and politician, actually. Um, uh, so, uh, Ibrahim, uh, oh my goodness. No, Shukranla. No, Shukranla. No, thank you. I have yeah. now a blackout. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> Lack of oxygen. <laughs> no problem. Okay. All righty. So, uh, the issue is that, yeah, and then later uh, I, I, I started to discover for myself a uh, documentary, but still one of the, um, the types of documentary that I like, I was very much inspired by Death, Death of a Prophet, for example, on Lumumba, mm. uh, which, is, which was shot by, um, uh, of course, I will not remember the name now, but I loved this film when it came yeah. out. It, it is a personal story combined with uh, with the story of of Lumumba uh, uh, and his death and his. Um, yeah. So this type of combination, I like. I liked, and, and this was a film that came out in the '90s. So that that was my schooling, everyone. But of course, also my real school was, you know, these years that I spent at the Metropolis in Hamburg, watching, you know, from Metropolis from the 1920s to, you know, the, the Brazilian novel Vague uh, and the French novel Vague, of course, yeah. and so on. This was my school, you know, my real film school. So let me ask you a question. I was going to save it for later, but this is probably the, the best time to ask you. Um, are there five films uh, from sort of the history of Arab cinema that you can very confidently say, those five films I have seen the most? I've seen them a, a countless number of times. The, they, they may not be my favorite films, but I have seen them so many times. I know them back and forth. Uh, actually, I, 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 I would rather say the ones that I l love most and watched a lot is, I guess, Horizons by Shadi Abdus Salem. Uh, uh, then, um, of course, also The Mummy. <laughs> but then the, the ones that really that I loved very much visually was, uh, for example, Sama, uh, the Tunisian by Najia bin Mabrouk. Uh, 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 Michel Khlifi's films I love. Uh, the visuals. I mean, these were the ones, let's say, the ones that are, ah, and of course, uh, you know, um, 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 Novi Bouzid's uh, uh, the man uh, the uh, uh, the man yeah. uh, it's called the ashes. Um, I love it. Uh, th these were were the films that kind of you know really opened opened my soul when I when I first watched them. Yeah, and then of course there are many other experiments that I I, I like very much. I like Kamel Jafari's uh, cinema uh, a lot. Uh, um, some of Elias Suleiman's films, uh, countless actually, uh, countless films that I could. Uh, Hassan Farhati, you know the documentaries, the Algerian documentaries. Uh, I love the novel va ma vague of Mar the Moroccan films, you know, like uh, um, uh, from the 1960s uh, films that are 10 minutes long films like uh, 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 six and 12 or uh, I love mm -hmm. Boanani's films are beautiful, you know. Um, La Memoire Ocre was a film by also a Moroccan film, which is more or less an, um, a, um, yeah, also an experimental visual ex experiment. Mm -hmm. um, I could name a lot of films. Okay, amazing. Um, do you have any films that you have seen the first time you didn't like them? Um, and then from the, from the history of Arab cinema that have really grown on you and you've, changed your mind about? 
or filmmakers, you can even talk about filmmakers where at first you really didn't like them. And then later on you, you said, I, I think I get them now. Yeah, I, I forgot actually for the films I really love, and that yeah. I think are masterpieces. Masterpieces also Nahla by Farouk Belufa, an Algerian mm -hmm. film. This is like one of the masterpieces uh, the, and actually also forgotten. And there was a remake, a sort of homage to it in, in Zanj Revolution uh, recently mm. that came out uh, by, also by uh, Tegea. So really these, are, these films should be watched together. Okay, now the ones that I, I had difficulties actually with appreciating some of the films by uh, um, uh, Omar uh, Barghouti. No, no, please help me. It's not. Um, I, I, have a, <laughs> I have a complete blackout. Oh, where is goodness. where is Omar from? No, 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 no. Wait, wait, wait. Syria. Okay, 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 okay. No, this is right. Really now, like, like very uh, humiliating for me. But okay, <laughs> Sadallah Wanous, uh, the film on Sadallah Wanous, for example. This is a film that I only watched recently, and I did Omar Amiralai. Thank you, Rael. I love you. Ah, yeah, <laughs> Omar Amiralai. You know, is the one that has a, you know he has a, such an ironic and sometimes also a tone where you think oh that hurts mm -hmm. but then when you watch the film several times they really start to work on you and you take mm -hmm. them with you and uh this is this, uh, of course his first films were visually of uh, very very rich so uh tough but rich yeah now, the the film like uh, there are so many things to to talk about this film on South Allah One News it's actually also online you can find it on YouTube this is a film that you were you have to watch several times in order really then to appreciate but okay it I tells mean... all about this generation and also about the kind of uh, dreams and fears that this generation uh, had until, you know, the, the, this, the first uh, filmmaker generation from non-Egyptian countries, the non-Egyptian countries. Yeah. Okay, I'm gonna ask you one last question before we go to the um, quick Q&A. And that is about um, a documentary. Um, as a medium. Uh, before we started the call, for me, I, I almost feel like um, documentaries are um, are the almost the most natural medium of, of this region. Um, and I'm curious why you chose to make this book and what about editing this book uh, surprised you in editing all the different essays from a really an amazing slate of scholars. You have an incredible list of scholars who are contributing to the book. Um, but I would be curious what you learned through that process and if there are any films or filmmakers that um, you gained a new appreciation for in, in the process of putting the book together. Um, well, this is actually part of um... This is part was part of a whole research project. So the first step was actually to collect. So uh, and and it led me to my uh, my monograph that is on on revolutionary Arab documentary. But uh, first of all, I had I had the feeling we need to plow the field. Now the book actually was conceived in 2016, 17. And unfortunately, you know, it is waiting, sitting at the publisher, unfortunately, since three years. Uh, for many reasons, I don't know, we are still one, uh, waiting for the, uh, you know, it's being designed right now. So we hope it comes out soon. Um, First of all, there was at the time when we went, now there is more on Arab documentary, luckily, but at the time when it was conceived, there was still no book on air or only one, one or two, you know, book in the making or had or just appeared, but when did not cover the whole field. Um, so uh, this is why I thought, okay, let's, um, yeah, 
try to uh, to do this and i'm really grateful to all yeah. the the scholars who were willing then you know to 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 share their experience and what uh, of course i did learn a lot on many many levels uh, but one of the the I mean that each of them has has you know something interesting, and you will see. Also, we try to kind of have a lot of different um, um, perspectives, also and and methodologies. So there is there there are even you know like essays, artistic essays included, or very personal experiences with films. Mm -hmm. But uh, one of the articles that I think will also contribute to something is looking at uh, you know the the the, the documentaries uh, coming from Dubai from uh, you know the uh, a female filmmaker there i think this is also uh, well we, we try to cover as much as, as we can but but i'm saying in the, in the introduction that this is just you know it's it was like opening the field but it's not covering yeah I want to talk about Arij real quick, um, one of your films that came out in 2014, and the relationship between um, how, how was it received, and the relationship between uh, sort of audiences and uh, films that have a more revolutionary spirit that are coming out now um, in Egypt and across the region. Uh well i mean this film is 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 uh, is let's say it was not one of the most seen films uh, that came out after the revolution maybe also because already at the time when i started doing it it was about being unable to tell a story about the revolution so for me it was rather going back so the whole film is actually showing my own struggle in telling a story uh, therefore, it is actually uh, hard to, 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 not everybody appreciates it, so it needs kind of more uh, patience to, uh, it, it, uh, yeah, so this is why, the, yeah, I have difficulties, actually still difficulties in speaking about it, because it has all the pain that was, you know, kind of that I felt at the time, uh, the pain of of uh, you know seeing how things get how the movement gets corrupted yeah. and how all the good intentions get corrupted which I saw you know kind of repeating and there we have the figure of Ala uh, also uh, a deep who did already uh, speak about a corrupted revolution before in one of his books so I it was kind of yeah trying to get in conversation with you know the older generation and also to kind of trace the problems look yeah. into first into history to understand the present uh i'm not sure i i managed yeah. to do so but it was an attempt yeah yeah okay let's do this quick q a and then we will open up to some questions from the audience so the first question is what have you been watching these days what are you watching right now what I'm watching right now, I'm watching a film by uh, Hakim uh, Belabes, <laughs> who was so kind to send me his <laughs> newest film. It's Collapsing Walls, and it's actually beautiful. It's quite poetic, with okay. a lot of small items from, his, from the village where he comes from. Let me ask you, if, what, is the ratio, what is the ratio between films that you watch that are from the last five, 10 years to films that are uh, older than that these days. Are you mostly watching contemporary films right now or do you well, sort of split? As I'm currently learning Italian, I was just, I, I was, I had, a, I have a very nice teacher who shared with me uh, Cecilia Manini, Mangini's work and she was a friend of Pasolini and her, her short films from the 1950s and 60s are visually amazing and stunning. Uh, so no, I'm looking, I'm watching both actually. And one of cool. my most favorite films ever is The Man with a Movie Camera by, uh, you know, from mm -hmm. uh, after the Russian revolution, made after the Re Russian revolution, 
by Chika Berthoff. So yeah. I can just recommend to watch old movies because at times you discover that they had invented already all and that we are really lagging behind. When I watched Cecilia Mangini's work now, I felt really ashamed because I felt that I'm, you know, I'm not working sufficiently on my on the visual level i'm too much with working with my brain <laughs> sure. this is why i was also dealing of course with documentary you know from the theoretical part because i'm trying as a filmmaker also to understand the medium beautiful so who would you love to shadow for a day past or present Shadow for a day. What does shadow mean in, in that respect? What do you just want? spend a day, spend a day with somebody um, or watch, watch them throughout their day, anytime from past or present. Yeah, what would I like to do? Hmm. Maybe <laughs> I would have loved to spend a day with, with the Palestinian film unit when they were trying to set up their studio at uh, their, uh, I mean, their lab, you know, the kitchen that uh, Sulafa Jadalla and there's also, I, I saw uh, Nadia Yaqub was here on the, no? Uh, she could tell us much more about this space. Amazing. Uh, what do people most misunderstand about your work? Uh, I think uh, some people misunderstand my work as cr a cr a chrono chronology, a chronological or chron right, yeah. chronicling Arab cinema, mm. um, particularly with popular Egyptian cinema, the book, the, when someone says this, it hurts because there is a lot of theory actually in it, also gender uh, theory and so on. But well, some people yeah. like to, you know, particularly this happens a lot with, you know, people who come into the field. So they try, you know, but actually I have to, to be honest that as a student, I was uh, also mm, arrogant like this. <laughs> and I also yeah. feel, uh, kind of, yeah, just swept away with some of the previous works, you know, saying, yeah, what are they doing? <laughs> yeah. Well, it happens. <laughs> And last question before we go to the uh, chat is outside of your profession, whose work inspires you? Um, I guess uh, sometimes uh, certainly um, hmm. uh, thinkers, of course, but you know, we read so, uh, yeah, there are so many people that you read. Uh, that I could not actually tell you immediately or right now who has inspired me most, you know, sure. but certainly also some of the people first. Yeah. Hard to, hard to tell. Yeah. No problem. Okay. Yes, me and you're up first. Um, hello. Hi. Uh, okay. So I have so many questions and I'm sorry about that. I guess my the question that I would like to start with is how do you see um, that strain of nationalism now? Like how like speaking about that influence on cinema, um, how do you see the current relationship between the government and art in today's like Egyptian cinema? Great, thanks, Yasmin. Um, you know, I think the relation, I mean, I don't want just to talk about Egypt because Egypt is just one of the Arab countries. And I think uh, we always try to break down this kind of Egyptocentrism uh, that is also uh, there. Uh, with regards to, you know, every Arab country has, uh, you know, its own kind of uh, com complicated um, um, complicated relationships with with you know governments, particularly all of the Arab countries have censorships, even Lebanon. Uh, but in the end, also you know other countries. I mean, also Europe has a certain indirect uh, censorship, and we have you know social censorship is something different than than the governmental censorship and censorships. Usually, we know there are also uh, uh, you know kind of of ranges of where you can you can 
you can um, negotiate because there are people and very often we had particularly also in e Egypt you had also people who were actually mm, uh, like for example um, Ali Abu Shadi, for instance, who was a film critic, of course, he was a representative then of the government, but in the end, he was also interested in the, in, in, you know, in, 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 in the films and was trying to defend sometimes filmmakers. But the, uh, but the, the governments have also so many other actually tools to, uh, you know, to clamp down on, on, on filmmaking or actually to, to, to monopolize filmmaking and, uh, one aspect is is just economical. You know, you can you can try to uh, create joint ventures and uh, or nationalize. There are also indirect ways. As I said, you can you can uh, create um, you know shadow companies or whatever, and then uh, you know monopolize um, uh, monopolize productions through it. And I think this is one of the problems that is currently happening in Egypt, particularly. But uh, uh, there are also other places where there are a lot of difficulties with regards to, you know, uh, film economy, and and it's it's very complicated. Yeah. Great. Thanks, Yasmin. Uh, Neil, you're up. Yes. Uh, thank you, Mike, and hello, Viola. Uh, nice to see you. Um, I have a question. I, I decided to rephrase it a bit. Do you uh, see uh, a new kind of cinema coming from somewhere, and could it be? Uh, even the Gulf, a friend of mine, he recently went to the Jeddah Film Festival and he was amazed by the upcoming young generation of Saudi filmmakers. Uh, yes, thank you. Hi, hi Neil. Um, yeah, yeah, of course. I, I mean, we are we are waiting and expecting <laughs> certainly that uh, there were already, you know, interesting filmmakers. I mean, I'm just, uh, I, I'm sure you, you remember um, uh, the film uh, Wajda uh, and there are others and uh, that were in the are in the making or or were made. Uh, so uh, uh, we are still, you know, waiting what 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 the Jida Film Festival will actually really do uh, in terms of of uh, you know um, creating a new film culture. Uh, we had, you know, seen in the Arab world a lot of these kind of, of um, uh, yeah, initiatives uh, created, you know, by either holding companies that are, you know, kind of indirectly related to a government. Uh, we have that, we had that in, in the whole Gulf region. Uh, the issue is that these, these kind of, 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 um, initiatives collapsed after one decade or so uh, due to, to different factors. So we will have to be patient and see what happens. Uh, but actually that there are interested individuals, some of them who went abroad, uh, this also applies to Saudi, uh, you know, to, the, to Saudi uh, Arabia. There have been also collective uh, small collectives who have been ac active already, you know, like almost 15 years ago, uh, starting to create a sort of independent film culture. It is just the issue, you know, uh, to which extent, uh, uh, you know, will they be allowed or can they survive or economically, but also, you know, in terms of artistically, we will see. Viola, I want to ask you one final question. Um, uh, what do you sort of see coming around the bend around, if you take a look, think about the next sort of 10 years of film in the region, especially with the advent of streaming services who realize that there is a real um, amount of money to be made with uh, global audiences interested in content coming in Arabic. Um, so what do you sort of see, what ero erosion to uh, independent film could there be what sort of propulsion of a new a new vision could there be? Um, are you optimistic these days or are you pessimistic and concerned for the next sort of 10 years of film coming from the region? Well, actually, you know, no, I mean, the development currently also, particularly because of the pandemic, um, 
has been you know kind of uh, uh, it has uh, it has kind of 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 um, uh, how do you say say that made, Perpetu made the, perpetuated made the, perpetuated the whole the whole development that was already there uh, even quicker so um, we will have to see, you know, what 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 happens. Uh, I'm not, you know, neither pessimistic nor optimistic. It is just a matter of visibility. You know, we know that people uh, went much more online now during the pandemic, and that uh, services like like Netflix have been and or YouTube, you know, uh, where you can on, put your films on demand and so on. It has benefits because some films were made accessible you know and for me also and I was just, you were speaking about the archives for me as a researcher I cannot tell how how much uh, how much many more films I was able to access now yeah. uh, and how quicker I was in in kind of retrieving films than I than it, it was ever possible before uh, on the other hand still there is a matter of you know we will see how the power relations will work that out I, of course these kind of services and platforms they give also an we have also you know like all the the avant-garde platforms that are mushrooming and and so on and the possibilities there also to find uh, you know uh, viewers uh, but then the, the the kind of power relations will not really change because still you have these kind of cen centers of power uh, that dominate, you know, the, these commercial centers of power that dominate and choose and and um, make the choices for you in a sense, you know, and of course also kind of form taste, the taste of the, and it's the same complaint that filmmakers have been making and producers have been making since, you know, the, the since the, um, you know, the 1960s, uh, we will have to see to which extent, you know, uh, the, the more artistically interested, but also not only, but also the films and filmmakers and, and productions that are interested in cultural resistance and, you know, in, 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 in also local content and uh, in, in indigenous cinema also, in indigeneity, how much, you know, uh, space will be left and can be actually is left or can be carved out for these uh, we will see you know yeah. but there is uh, but this has been always you know a fight and there is an equilibrium also that is kind of has to be found and uh, yeah we are looking for it well viola thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us and for doing all of your work and publishing everything so widely i really appreciate it thank you mickey thank you so much for your for your invitation of course yeah of and course for, for everybody for to listen for listening thank you okay everybody enjoy your night and your weekend see you soon